Well, welcome to the show, Phil. So glad you could join us. Why don't we start off by just telling our listeners a little bit about yourself, just your background, maybe educationally and vocationally, and then we'll do a deeper dive on some of these topics. No problem, Joe. Thanks for having me. It's a real honor to be here with you today. Um, my, my name's Phil McGuire. I, I, how far back do I go? I'm the youngest of four brothers. Um, I grew up in a suburb of South Manchester. Um, I spent a lot of my childhood getting into all sorts of trouble and scrapes. Um, eventually, after leaving home at 16, managed to talk my way into university at the age of 22. Um, did a degree in international development. Um, then spent a few years doing various bits and pieces before deciding that I wanted to pursue my passion for interest in radio. And I did a master's degree in broadcast journalism, which was one of the best decisions I ever made. It led me to a job at the BBC where I worked as a, a radio reporter and producer. And that led me to the job that I'm in today, so many years later. Um, I'm I'm married to a wonderful woman called Nikki, and we've got two boys, uh, Arthur and Otis, who are 13 and 7. Um, and we live in the UNESCO World Heritage City of Bath in the southwest of England. And it's a, an, an honour and a pleasure to, to live here. Um, yeah, so I'm doing okay, Joe. Thanks for asking. I am the second of four brothers, so our mothers have a lot in common there. Um, yeah, indeed. She used to say to us all the time, why mothers go gray? She would point to her gray hairs that she attributed to us, but nonetheless. Well, <laughs> so, Joe, Joe, being the youngest, you probably didn't get this as much as me, but being the youngest, I, I grew up thinking my name was Paul, Simon, Dominic, Philip. Um, and they're the names of my older brothers, of course. So. Yeah, I got a lot of Jim, Joe, John, Jeff. My <laughs> all the Jays. We were all Jay, so it it, it can you know aggravated the situation even more for my poor mother. Yes, Jim, oh, Joe, mother. John, Jeff. So tell us about your efforts back in two thousand and five to build a model for setting up prison radio projects across the UK. Okay, um, well, I, I should probably go back a bit further just to to give you a bit of context. Um, Feltham is uh, Her Majesty's prison and young offender institution. Feltham is young offenders prison. Um, just on the outskirts of London. And in the early 90s, it was notorious. It was in the newspapers and the press and media a lot for all the wrong reasons. Um, they were experiencing deaths in custody, uh, racial tension, riots. And there were two neighbours and friends who lived close to the prison. Neither of them had ever worked in, in radio or in prisons before, but over a glass or two of wine one night, they were lamenting the sorry state of their local prison and came up with this amazing idea to set up a radio station in the prison. So they did that, they went in and they did that, they made that happen. Um, and it ha it worked on its own in isolation for quite a few years before any sort of outside attention was attracted. So um, eventually one of the, the founders of the radio station there wrote to the head, the director general of the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, to see if the BBC was interested in exploring the potential for prison radio. And that's, that's where I got involved. So, my, my background is I, I was a, a residential social worker. I worked in children's homes in Manchester, changed careers, got a master's in broadcast journalism and, and worked at the BBC. And it was while I was at the BBC that I learned about this project at Felton. And then I found out that there was a partnership, a big pilot project being set up in, in Birmingham, in the Midlands in the UK, um, to, to see where the prison radio could be developed. And there were a number of partners involved in that. So there was the BBC, the prison service, uh, the two people who'd set up the original project at Feltham and various others. And they had, the BBC advertised a job for somebody to manage this pilot and I applied and I got it. So I moved from the studio that I was in in London to Birmingham and spent nine months thinking about how we could improve, develop, widen participation in prison radio in the UK. So we sort of changed tack a little bit. We, we set up two projects in which the thrust was really giving absolutely crucial information to people in prison when they needed it the most. And we integrated education. We worked out how involving people in prison in the production process could lead to them getting qualifications. So that took nine months. That was from September 2005 until summer 2006. It was all very successful. Everybody was very pleased. But at the end of it, it became really clear that if this was going to continue to develop, then an organization was going to have to be set up to manage the development of that. And that was when, much to the dismay of my mother, I left 
uh, the job of her dreams for me at the BBC to become the first employee of a brand new charity, the Prison Radio Association. So, so that that's how we got to the founding of the Prison Radio Association. Okay, and that brings us up, like you said, to about 2006 yeah. is when you founded the, the the Prison Radio Association, correct? Yeah. Um, developing radio campaigns, radio stations, fantastic. Um, tell our listeners about your work to launch the Prison Radio Podcast Network. Okay, so, well, I, I can get to that, but that messes out a huge chunk, which I, I hope you don't mind if I step backwards and talk to you about what happened after 2006, what happened- Let's go back in time. Up. Let's go back in time. So, so 2006, we set up the Prison Radio Association. The aim of the organization was to support anybody in, in the UK that was interested in developing prison radio, to support people in prison through their sentences, to help to reduce reoffending. Um, and we, I visited lots of prisons, gave advice to lots of people, started to build a community of prison radio practitioners. And one day I had this incredible meeting at a prison called Her Majesty's Prison Brixton in South London. Um, met with the, the guy who was in charge of the prison, the governor, uh, a guy called Paul McDowell. And he was interested in the idea of prison radio and he knew a bit about it from Felton. And at the end of my meeting, he said, look, you've convinced me. I don't need convincing anymore. We want one of these radio stations. But Phil, I want you and the Prison Radio Association to run it. And I want this to be the best that it can be. So we found a space inside the prison. We found some money from somewhere. We employed uh, a couple of extra people. And we set up the UK's first 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week radio station, HM, HM Prison Brixton. And it was called Electric Radio Brixton. We started slowly. We we knew that people that live in prison were the real experts. So we want we wanted as radio producers to learn from them about what the important issues were, what we should be talking about, how we should be talking about those things. And we started slowly, built it up. And in 2009, we entered what were called the Sony Radio Academy Awards, which are or were like the Oscars of UK radio industry. And, and we were the story of the night. We were the big headline story of the night. We won four awards. We won two golds and two bronze. Um, one of the awards was for an interview with a former cabinet minister, a former uh, very, very senior politician who'd been in prison. Um, and it attracted some attention. And we used that attention and that success. There aren't many positive stories about things that go on in prison. So we used that success and that attention to try and convince the government that this radio station that existed in one prison in London should be spread to all prisons. Uh, so we pitched the idea of national prison radio. We had lots of meetings, lots of report writing, lots of convincing. And eventually we did convince the government that that was the way to go. And, and we started then to broadcast to two prisons, three prisons, four prisons, until eventually we're broadcasting around the clock, 24 hours a day, to all of the prisons in England and Wales. And we're at the point now where 99% of people in prison know about us. 89% of people in prison listen to us for an average of about 16 hours a day, which is, it's a phenomenal achievement. And, and the aim of the station is to support people while they're inside, give them information they can't get anywhere, you know, signpost them to services that are available to them inside and outside and try and help people to stay out of prison. So that that's the the overall aim of the station. So that's that's my day job. That's the Prison Radio Association's day job. That's what we focus most of our efforts on is, is national prison radio. But there are other things we're interested in and actively doing as well. Well, we'll get to some of those other things later. Let's um, slow down and shame on me for fast forwarding um, so much. Maybe just share with our listeners sort of a a day in the life, if you will, or if somebody is listening to National Prison Radio, what's you know what's that like content wise? What can what, what would listeners expect or be exposed to? Can can I just apologize most sincerely? I'm going to have to just duck out for one second. Can I come back in one second? Most certainly, most certainly. Really sorry, but I'm in the middle of an interview in America. That's all right. I just you you're on the recording. Sorry about that. Just quietening the family down. Sorry, ask me that question again, if you would, Joe. So just maybe uh, so our listeners have an idea um, what an individual listening to National Prison Radio, sort of, a, again, sort of like a not a day in the life, but, you know, content wise, what would a listener expect if they were to tune in? Um, what would they be, you know, again, exposed to? And again, what are you trying to share with the goal behind folks listening? I'm really glad you asked me that because that's that's the sort of the heartbeat of what we do is the programs that we make and, and what comes out of the box, what comes out of the speaker. Um, 
the challenge that we've got is that we've got a population of people that aren't necessarily used to listening to speech radio and and we need to get them to develop the speech radio habit um and 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 hopefully later when they're leaving prison the podcast listening habit um we we play a range of content we produce and broadcast a range of content and it's a mix of of music and speech so the music's there for a few reasons people love music for a lot of people that live in prison national prison radio is their only regular access to music um so people often come to us for the music but then hopefully they stay for the the programs that we make that involve speech that involve discussions about issues that are relevant to them that that make them feel stuff that make them think about their situations and that, that make them take action or that encourage them to take action so a typical day um 7 a.m the station starts with a breakfast show called Porridge. Now, anybody listening to this in the U, I mean, you nodded as if you knew what I was talking about there, but there was a very famous TV show in the UK called Porridge, and it was uh, a fictional prison, um, and it was fantastic. And, and Porridge is traditionally what was served for breakfast in prisons. So what else could we call our National Prison Radio Breakfast Show? So Porridge is an upbeat start to the day. It's a mix of music and speech um, and, and trying to set people up on the right track. And, and then we have a, a variety of other content, speech and music. So I'll give you a few examples. I'm just having a look here at a schedule on another screen. Um, we, we have two hours a day, we have a request show. The most simple and probably the oldest form of radio is people saying, can you play me this and play me that? So it's, it's, it's really simple stuff. And often people will get in touch with us and just say, can you play me this tune? Sometimes people will write their life story or talk to us about how they are planning to change things for themselves when they're in and when they're outside. So the, the request show is a really important thing. Uh, Books Unlocked is a program that we we make and broadcast every night. So it's kind of as you're tucking yourself up in bed, you can listen to, an, I guess, an audio book, a reading of a book. All the books that we broadcast are Booker Prize nominated books. So sort of the, the very best books that have been published in the last year in the UK. And and as often as we can, we try and get the authors on to to be interviewed by people in prison to talk about the, the meaning of their book. Um, what else have we got? We've got a, a variety of specialist music shows. We've got a program uh, called The Love Bug, which is um, it's b basically a love song program um, during which the presenters encourage people to write home to their loved ones. Um, we have NPR Talk, which is a, it's a, a nice umbrella for, for a variety of different shows that we broadcast at around 6 p.m. Um, we have a, a regular reggae show. We, we, we do a lot of b different different kinds of programs to, to because we think about prisoners as being one audience, but actually you've got people in all the different parts of the country and varying in, in age from, you know, teenagers to very old people. So we've, we've got a very broad church of people we need to appeal to. So some of the stuff we hope everybody will listen to, some of the stuff we know is appointment to listen. You know, people will come to us because of that specific program. And you brought up a good a, a good point there that this is not just your audience is just not those individuals within the prison system, um, but outside as well. Correct. No, National Prison Radio is only available inside prisons. Oh, it is. So, okay. so yeah. So it's the, the, and, and this is uh, an interesting point. How how do people in prison listen to National Prison Radio? Right. Um, so we at the moment we we broadcast via satellite. And from the very beginning, we broadcast via satellite. So we assemble all of our programs ahead of time so for example tomorrow morning's breakfast show will be recorded this afternoon so we try and make things as close to broadcast as possible so they're relevant and timely and uh, but we we build our schedule we send everything via the internet to our satellite broadcasters who beam the signal up to a satellite and then send it out and then on the roof of every prison in the country there is a satellite dish that picks up that signal and then every t every cell has a tv set in the corner um, and the, the, the audio signal is cabled into the TV set. So you have 10 channels available on the TVs. Nine of them are TV channels, and, and the 10th channel is national prison radio available as a radio channel. So that's how the vast majority of people in prison listen to us. But there's, there's a new system called the Digital Hub, um, which is a pilot which hopefully is being rolled out across all prisons. So in two prisons at the moment, soon to be more, um, each person who lives in that prison has a, a sort of a little laptop and they're able to access information about various things. They can't access the internet, but they can access information. They can organize visits. They can organize their canteen. Um, and they can listen either on a live stream to National Prison Radio 
or there's a bank of content that they can listen again to. And, and we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of listens to our content by the digital hub. So that's how people listen. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm an inmate serving a sentence and I want to get involved with national prison radio. Maybe just sort of walk us through what does that look like as far as getting, getting talent, getting personnel to, to make national prison radio happen. Yeah, so so we we are we have bases in two prisons, Brixton Prison, men's prison in London, and Style Prison, a prison for women near Manchester in the north of England. And if you're serving a sentence in those prisons, you can uh, fill in an app, an application form, um, and it's it's, a, it's the same app that you'd fill in if you wanted to do any course or any job in the prison, and you write on it National Prison Radio, and you you write down why you're interested in getting involved. They get sent to our team. They leaf through them, they they shortlist, and essentially it's like applying for a job. So, um, as long as they're going to be in the prison for a decent length of time, and as long as they've got the basic skills that they need to be able to operate in a professional radio studio environment, we'll interview them for for the job. And and if they've got the right aptitude and they're interested in doing it for the right reasons, then when a space becomes available, they'll be, they'll be given a job on the national prison radio team, and that's where they start learning. So they learn on the job. We try and create the, the radio studios we've got don't feel like they're in a prison um, we try and make them feel as much like their professional radio studios as possible and we try and give the people that are involved a real life professional radio experience and that they learn a range of skills so they learn they develop their, their writing skills their research skills uh, obviously computer skills editing um, and then the really the, the stuff that I think is really important which is being able to interview somebody, being able to have a conversation with somebody in a, an affable, articulate, polite, sometimes very forceful, but diplomatic way. Um, and if you can develop the skills and the confidence to do that, to sit opposite somebody, to look them in the eye, to have a conversation, an, an honest conversation with them, they're skills that go a long way on the outside. And we don't expect that everybody that gets involved in prison radio on the inside is going to stay interested in radio or is going to work in radio. But the skills that they they develop, we hope, will will help them in whatever it is they decide to do. You brought it up. Now I have to ask, do you have any any stories, even anecdotal information as to post-release success stories with individuals who you planted that seed at National, <clears throat> excuse me, National Prison Radio and, and they've they've gone on to use those skills post-release? Yeah, I mean, this is something we've wanted to do for a long time is to not not only see people go on and be successful. And and I think in the early days we were quite careful about this because the prison service in the early days didn't really know a lot about radio and they're interested in lots of things, rehabilitation, getting people in, into employment. And they thought, oh, great, this is a new opportunity to get lots of people to get jobs in the radio industry. And it was unrealistic. So at the beginning, we were quite honest with people and, and quite brutal that just because you spend three months, six months, 12 months working on national prison radio doesn't mean you're going to go and get a job in radio. It's a very competitive industry. There are lots, thousands of white middle-class young people coming out of universities with degrees in radio, media, journalism every year that struggle to get jobs in the industry. So just because you've done a bit of prison radio doesn't mean you're going to be able to walk into a job. That said, we don't want to hold anybody back. And we like, we like people that have got ambition and want to work hard and get on. So over the years, there have been a few examples. Um, I, I noticed on LinkedIn yesterday, there's a guy that we worked with many, many years ago who has recently just uh, spent a marathon being a vision mixer. He's a vision mixer. He works in TV. So he's gone over to the dark side, what we call the dark side. But it, it, he's, he spent a marathon session vision mixing all of that. We've, we've had a series of elections here, local elections. And he was vision mixing those for a, for a big TV channel. So, so he, he's a great example. There's another guy that we worked with in Brixton called Hilary Ineomo Marcus. Now, Hilary is um, now a good friend and, and a bit of a legend. He was great when we worked with him inside. And when he got out, we continued to work with him. And we, we, he stayed involved and he offered his services and he wanted to help us with whatever he could do. And he's presented lots of programs for us. And he's actually gone on to present award-winning programs. Um, he's been honored at the, you know, the highest levels in the radio industry. He's presented programs for the BBC's biggest speech radio network, BBC Radio 4. And he's now on my board of trustees. So I'm the chief executive and I'm the boss, but I then have a group of bosses that sit above me. And Hillary, who used to be in one of the prisons that we work in, is now my boss, which is a fantastic story. But everything's changed over the last 15 months or so. COVID has changed everything because um, we 
rely on working side by side, hand in hand with people that live in prison. We couldn't do it on our own. Um, but since March last year, we came out of prison and, and we weren't able to go back in. So we've not been able to work um, alongside any serving prisoners for that for that length of time. Now, we, we sort of regrouped as a team and decided what we should do. We have a, a staff team of 20 people. So we pulled everybody out of prison. We sent them all home. We, we set them all up with, you know, portable radio studios so they could produce programs from home. And for years and years, me and a colleague, Andrew, have been, you know, over a beer in the pub talking about, can you imagine if we were able to bring back all of the very best people we've worked with over the last decade or so in prison and give them a job working with us on National Prison Radio. So that, that's what we did. COVID uh, gave us the opportunity to do that. So we, we got in touch with lots of former uh, National Prison Radio presenters and producers that lived inside and asked them if they wanted to come and work with us on the outside. We now have a regular roster of, of about 10 or a dozen uh, people that used to live in prison who work with us as, as presenters and, and as producers. And that's been an incredible experience for us for lots of reasons. The, the radio station has never sounded better. It's never been more of a lifeline. I'll come back to the lifeline bit in a minute. It's never been more of a lifeline. Um, but the idea that we're now working with and staying in contact with people that used to be in prison and helping them to develop skills on the outside has been phenomenal. And, and it's that work on the outside that really I kind of nudges people in, in the right direction in terms of work. And we've recently written our next three-year strategic plan, a business plan. And one of our four strategic aims is to support people in the criminal justice system into the audio industry. The audio industry right now in the UK is having a, a long, hard look at itself. Um, most production companies and radio stations have signed something recently called the Equality in Audio Pact. Um, and so the audio industry is looking to become more representative of the nation, more diverse. And I think we can play a really important role in that, in finding people roots into the industry from having worked in National Prison Radio. So a, a big change for us over the last 12 months and, and specifically relevant to finding opportunities for people that used to be in prison. That is amazing, Phil. That is amazing. Um, so I'm so glad you brought me back there before I got to my podcast question. But uh, I know you've been mentioning the sort of evolution here, and now you're starting to dabble a little bit, it looks like, with um, podcast as well, correct? Yeah, well, we've, I've been a podcast listener for years and years and years. I mean, I am unashamedly an audio addict, a radio addict, and I've been listening to lots and lots and lots of it for many, many years, and I'm quite involved in the industry. And as soon as podcasting became a thing, I, I got into it as a listener. Um, and my listening habits changed drastically because of it. Um, but for a few years now, we've been making podcasts. So but part of what we do as an organization is we run National Prison Radio. We're also a production company. So we make programs for people. Many of our clients are organizations who want to get their messages to people inside prisons. So we work in partnership with people to turn their you know, their, their workshops, their aims, their objectives, to turn them into compelling audio stories or, or, or audio products. And we put them on National Prison Radio. We also are a supplier to the BBC. So we make radio documentaries for, for the main BBC radio networks. And the interesting thing about podcasting is that it's revolutionized audio production for production companies. People can become their own commissioning editors now. They can just, you know, anyone can do it. Anyone can just get a microphone and make a podcast. And, you know, millions of people are. Um, so we've been dabbling in that field for a while. And many of the partners that we work with on the inside want to work with us to reach people on the outside as well. So over the last few years, we've, we've developed nine different series of podcasts and we see that this is a really important part of where we're going and of what we're doing. So again, back to our new business plan, one of the strategic aims in the business plan is to, to develop the Prison Radio Podcast Network. So all of the nine series that we've made previously, some of them have been, by our standards, incredibly successful. Um, they've all been because a partner's come to us or because we've struck up a conversation with a partner and we've been paid to make a podcast on behalf of somebody else almost all of them related in some one way or another to criminal justice but there's never been until now sort of a strategic plan around what we're going to do with all that so the the national uh, sorry the prison radio podcast network is is a stable within which to house all of our podcasts to brand all of our podcasts and and to to expand our network of podcasts 
uh, and specifically, we, we, what we want to do is make a noise around criminal justice. So we're still going to continue to work with criminal justice partners, you know, NGOs, charities that work in the sector, statutory government bodies, government departments that, that are interested in the sector that want us to tell their stories. We'll still do that. But what we'd love to do with podcasts is what we do with National Prison Radio, which is create content around life after prison. Mm -hmm. So in, inside, we talk about how to survive prison, how to how to thrive in prison even, and how to get on when you get out. The nat and, and people in, inside say to us all the time, can we listen to something like this on the outside? Can we listen to this on the outside? And we say no. So what we're hoping to do is to create a, at least one series, possibly two separate regular series, that talk directly to people that used to be in prison about life after prison. Yeah, that is inspiring on so many levels. Forgive me if I'm jumping around to the chronology here. Uh, I know Feel you free. keep yourself so busy, other roles, uh, including supporting and judging the British Podcast Awards, the Third Sector Awards. And I know you've got some connections with um, Reform Radio. Talk a bit about Reform Radio, if you would, please. Yeah, of course. Um it's one of my proudest achievements being involved with Reform Radio. So they, they came to me in about 2014, I think, um, to say, can, can we have a coffee or a beer to, to have a chat about what we're doing? We want some advice. This is a, a fairly new radio station. So it's, it's Manchester-based. I'm from Manchester. I grew up there. This is a Manchester-based radio station um, that's an internet radio station, so it's available anywhere in the world. And it's a great, sh it's a great station. It sounds great. And and the radio is is a really good, almost a byproduct of what they're doing because their main purpose is to try and provide opportunities for young people and young adults to get into employment. So that's the reason for their existence. So they run loads of projects. They run mentoring schemes. They they deliver training around employability. Um, but but they since. 2014, 2015, when I first got involved, and I was on their board from 2015 to 20, 2020. I stepped down in 2020. Um, the 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 difference that they've made to thousands of people's lives has been absolutely incredible. And the journey that I've seen them go on, I mean, there are three directors that when I first knew them, there were just three of them. They shared a single email address. They shared an office. Um, they started off in a basement in one of their houses, one of their rented houses. So it was a tiny organization. And and now I don't. they've got a dozen or so staff. They've got an amazing set of studios and an amazing office space. They have workshops going on all the time. They're having a global impact. And they, and we, I, I mean, I go to the big radio awards and the, you know, media awards, and you often see them on the stage, you know, doing speeches. So to have been involved in that's been a real a privilege and a pleasure. And, and anything I've been able to do to support them has, has been a pleasure. But I've learned an awful lot from them about about how they operate um, and about how to do things in a, in a really sensitive, caring and democratic way. You mentioned some of these numbers earlier. They really tell the story of National Prison Radio's impact. 99% of people in prisons know about National Prison Radio. 89% of people in prison listen for an average of 16.2 hours each week and about 10 and a half average weekly weekly hours spent listening and arguably most inspiring. In the last 12 months, you have received over 36,000 communications, letters, calls from people behind bars. You mentioned the lifeline earlier and the context of, of COVID. Impressive numbers, but that's got to be a, a, a great feeling. I mean, it's an incredible feeling to think that, you know, all those years ago, somebody thought prison radio might be a good idea. And now it absolutely is a lifeline. Um, the, the listening hours have gone up massively over the last 12 months, and that's as a result of COVID. Um, and also the correspondence that we get. So we, we've got lots of different ways that we measure our impact and measure our success. But we often say that the, the key one is, is correspondence, is contact from people that live in prison. So historically, that comes in the the form of snail mail of letters you know pen to paper because in theory people in prison don't have access to mobile phones or the internet and they can't tweet or or email so historically that's been how they reach us and and pre-pandemic we were getting around six seven thousand letters a year from from a prison population of, of eighty thousand um we did have a, a sort of a free phone line an information line uh, that prisoners could phone I, I use the word prisoners, then I, I really don't like the word prisoners. Um, and there's an interesting conversation to be had around language. 
I don't like the word inmate. I don't like the word prisoner because I think it puts a label on people. I hate the word offender and ex-offender, which people still use a lot in this country. Um, they they are people that are in prison. Uh, so forgive me for 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 that tangent. Um, so yes, we had the free phone line open before, but we we wouldn't advertise it very widely because we we didn't have the capacity to man it to 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 have to. It, you, you phone up and and you get an answer phone and you leave a message. Um, and we would use that very sparingly. If we were doing a partnership with somebody and and part of that partnership was a call to action for people in prison to, to do something specific or to request an information pack, we'd give out the phone number. When the pandemic hit, we realized that people in prison were being locked up for 23, 23 and a half hours a day in their cells, often with a stranger, um, scared and without much information about COVID. All visits were stopped, personal visits and professional visits. All therapy stopped, all education stopped, all worship stopped, um, and, and only essential jobs were taking place. So if you were involved in cleaning or cooking, you might get a chance to get out of your cell, but most people were, were locked in their cells for all that time. And, and we made the decision to divert some resources at the free phone line. We opened it permanently and gave the number out a lot and said to people in prison, um, call us, ask us questions, tell us how you're feeling. And, and, and then there were very specific asks as well. Um, and we went from getting, you know, six or 7,000 letters to getting, you know, 36, 40,000 calls in a year. We've got people that whose job is now to sit listening, transcribing, logging all of those calls. But but they're a great source of content for us. They, they, they're a really good way of us taking the pulse of the prison population about knowing what's going on. Um, an interesting innovation that's happened during COVID is that we, we've we been working very closely in partnership with the communications team at the Ministry of Justice and at the prison service. So, so they came to us to say how, you know, how and why and, and, and in what ways should we communicate with people in prison? And we, came, we worked with them to come up with lots of ideas. One of them was to have a, a weekly slot on the radio station for the director general of prisons, where we put questions to him directly from people inside. And most of those come through that, that phone line. So yeah, we have been providing more of a lifeline than ever. It's been a terrible, terribly difficult time for people that live and for people that work in prisons. Um, but we feel like we've stepped up to the challenge. The station sounds better than it's ever done. We're at a really interesting stage now where we are just about to tentatively take the first steps back into prison. And and what the challenge for me and, and for the whole team is how do we get back to where we were without losing all of the things that we developed and learnt through this crisis? So it's, you know, building back better. Um, we, we are going to have a mixed economy of, of how we operate. So people are still going to have home studios, home offices. People are going to go into prison, but not as often as they, they did before. And, and hopefully we're going to be able to develop an even better, even stronger and more impactful service. National Prison Radio is behind some award-winning productions of radio programs. We mentioned the podcast, media campaigns, and now even animation and film. Of course, your network is full of talented people with firsthand knowledge of the challenges of prison. You mentioned your great experiences with Hillary. Any other experience you can share uh, with those projects or, again, other um, sort of inspiring stories to share? Mm. Um, tell me an inspiring story. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I think the, the, the most inspiring, I mean, I, I understand that, that it might be interesting to hear about an individual person's journey and their story. But the most inspiring thing to me is, well, two things. And this has been the same for years and years and years. The thing that most inspires me is to see the personal change in people inside through their involvement at Prison Radio. And and I'll, I'll take you back to 2005 when I was first doing this, when I first visited a prison, which was a bizarre experience. And we'd, we'd arranged, a, we'd mocked up a little studio. We'd got a group of, of men uh, to come in and they'd, they'd agreed to come in and, you know, be the guinea pigs around this Prison Radio idea. And there was this one guy the first time I met him, he wouldn't sit still in his chair. He was shuffling about. He was awkward. He wouldn't look me in the eye. Um, and I could barely get a word out of him. We set the project up. We had it up and running. I'd not been in there for about two weeks. I was I was busy doing something else. And I went back after two weeks. And I walked in the door and this guy ran over to me, looked me in the eye, shook me in the hand, shook, shook my hand 
and thanked me for allowing him to get involved. And just the personal change in that guy was, I think, the spark and the inspiration that's driven me on and kept me going for all these years. But the real inspiring thing is the fact that we came up with this idea all those years ago. And now, as you say, 99% of people in prison know about us. 89% of people listen for more than 16 hours a week. And we're winning awards in the criminal justice sector, in the, you know, in the, uh, the charity sector. We were named Charity of the Year a few years ago. And we regularly compete at the highest levels. And this is important for, for a few reasons, at the highest levels in the radio industry. So anyone that works in radio or audio in the UK knows about the Prison Radio Association, even, they, they, even though they can't listen to our station. And that's because every year we, we win all of these awards. When we first started doing what we do now, we were adamant that it wasn't worth messing about doing this. It wasn't worth making a second-rate radio station if we're going to build a station, we want to make it sound as good as it possibly can, because there's no point in doing this if people don't listen. So from day one, quality was incredibly important to us. And I, I know because I, I am bombarded with requests from journalists who want to work in partnership with us or we've got an idea for a project. Essentially, what they all want to do is, is help is, is get me to help them get into prison with their microphones or their cameras because there are fascinating stories in there and they're hard to get. So we're in a unique position where we're in a, a fantastically interesting and oppressive and difficult environment with people who've got incredible stories to tell and an audience who has a real need to be fulfilled. So if we couldn't get it right, then we should pack up and go home, you know, but we we are represented at these awards every year uh, and we win big we win big and, and and that's important for a few reasons those awards are important because i've got a really hard working dedicated fantastic team of radio producers who could have jobs in nice offices and studios at the bbc but they choose to work in in prisons and they go until pandemic they, they go in every day and work very very hard so it's great for them to know that they are respected and applauded by the industry for the for the men and women that live in prison and that work with us on a day-to-day -day basis for them to know they're part of something special and respected is important and for our audience a big part of what we do to operate is we have to go out and raise money we have to convince people to give us money grants to fund our work and so to be able to say look we're really good at this is, is very very helpful but all of that as important as, as it is is just the icing on the cake the most important bit is the impact that we have on people's lives and it's it's that which it's it's amazing we have a, a slack channel a, a team communication channel and we have one of our channels is called letters and so occasionally if we get a great letter in one of the team will type a bit of it up and recently we've been getting letter after letter after letter from people listening to us saying national prison radio has saved my life I was on the edge of suicide, I heard something inspiring, or it felt like a friend. And it just that, for me, is the inspiration. The, the fact that people claim that we have stopped them harming themselves or kill, killing themselves is, is absolutely inspirational to me, and, and it drives us on. I asked for an inspirational story, Phil, and you gave me an inspirational story. That was fantastic. There you uh, go. I didn't, when I stopped, when I opened my mouth at the beginning, I had no <laughs> idea where I was going. Uh, do you have any future projects on the horizon and or if I were to have you back on the show say in five years, what do you in your utopian crystal ball? What do you envision us perhaps talking about? Well, do you know what I'm most excited about at the moment? I mean, National Prison Radio is, is as I said, it's the lifeblood of what we do and it's, it's crucially important. And I'm really lucky that I have a fantastic team that manage that. Um, the, the thing that I'm personally most excited about is Prison Radio International. Um, over the years, we've been doing this. So, so the Prison Radio Association is, is, as far as I understand, we were the first organization in the world to develop and run a national radio station for prisoners. And during the time that we've been doing that, now for more than 15 years, we found out about other people doing similar things or, or there are people that have come to us and been inspired by our work. And, um, and I get quite a lot of requests for support, for help. Um, so the first time that went anywhere really was i think 11 years ago um we had a visit from people from trinidad and tobago they they're an inspirational couple who uh, have a, a weekly radio show on on na the national broadcaster in trinidad and tobago called ion dependency um he's called garth he's a former um soldier 
who got into drugs when he was in in the services and got kicked out and put into military prison. Uh, and she she was a, a long an old friend of his. And when he was getting out of prison, he was trying to work out what he should do next. And he knew that she had some involvement with radio. And he said, I've got an idea for a radio show. So they, they launched this show, Eye on Dependency, which is about drug trafficking and drug addiction and, and, and the impacts of those things. And, and they got in touch with us. They came over here to try and talk to Caribbean nationals who are locked up in British prisons for, for bringing drugs over to Britain. So we, we helped them do that. We helped them get into prison to, to access those people to do those interviews. And while they were here, they saw what we were doing and they said, we should, we should have this in Trinidad. We should have this in Trinidad. Long story short, they invited us over. We went, me and a colleague, Andrew, went over. We did a big pitch to uh, the, the national press and media. We were on breakfast TV. We met the head of the prison service. We did a big pitch to the justice minister and they committed to developing prison radio in Trinidad. And 11 months later, we went back and we helped to cut the ribbon. Um, and we made a radio documentary for BBC World Service about that, which is called Reality Radio. It's still available on the BBC World Service website. So that was our baptism of fire with working with another country. But since then, we've been working with, with people all over the world. Um, there's lots of prison radio in activity in Australia. I went over there and spoke at a conference a couple of years ago. Um, there was a brilliant radio project in prisons in Hungary, which is currently on hiatus. India prison radio is, is developing enormously. There's Dr. Uh, Fartika Nanda, who runs an organization called Tinker Tinker, who's doing great work there. Israel have got the world's second national radio station for prisoners. Norway have got a phenomenal project, and they've got some great colleagues in Norway who have been working with to bring everybody together around the world. Poland's a very interesting place where every prison in Poland has a radio station. Um, they've been there for decades. They're there not for the, not necessarily for the reasons that we set up prison radio, but there's lots of potential there. Republic of Ireland, there's activity going on. Scotland, north of the border here, there's great prison radio project. Sweden, Trinidad and Tobago. And in the USA, there's lots going on. So we've been working alongside the Air Hustle guys who, who work at San Quentin. Um, we've been working with, recently with the De Denver University Prison Arts Initiative, We've been working with Uncuffed, which is a project out of KALW, a public radio station, again, near San Francisco. Uh, and then there's Pelican Bay State Prison in Northern California. They, they run a, a podcast called Unlocked. So we've been working with all of those people and bringing them together, trying to build a global community of prison radio practitioners. Uh, and we met in November for our first official uh, international conference. And we're meeting again next week. Um, to, to bring all of those people back together, to talk about what we do, to to pat each other on the back, to give each other a virtual hug, and to share our experiences with each other on our challenges, because there are some massive challenges in what we do. Um, so that is what I'm most excited about, and, I, and I'm delighted that I've been able to take the time to to, de to devote to that, to help to develop it. That is amazing to think that all started with your inspiration way back when. It's got to be a great, a great, great feeling, Phil. Phil McGuire of National Prison Radio, thank you so much for joining us. I hope we can chat again so you can give us all an update on, on, on what you're up to and the great work you're doing. Anytime, Joe. It's been a real pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank you.